baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. 16. Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22.16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3.5, Romans 6, 3 through 6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. I'm going to ask you to turn with me to the book of uh, John, chapter number 16. While you're turning there, I know that this is a revival month, and uh, I'm, I, I don't know where this falls into the line of revival, except to tell you that if you don't need this message tonight, you will need it sometime in your life. And some of you may say, I wish I'd have heard this earlier, but I... Uh, I know this is a revival month, and um, I was going to, I was planning on preaching this, and and uh, but I'm, we're driving to church tonight, and I have a, 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 a gallon bag of scriptures and names. There's hundreds and hundreds of scriptures. I don't have all of them. I don't have 31,000 plus there, but I got a lot of them. And I reached down and I dug around and I pulled up the text that we're going to read tonight. And that was a sweet confirmation. So God knows. God knows. God knows. And uh, your pastor and others here have recently heard me preach this. And um, here we go. This morning we talked about the garden. Anybody thankful for the garden? Anybody thankful for the garden? Well, this is something that Jesus had to say in verse 33 of John 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world... You shall have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Amen. Let's pray and ask that our gracious God would talk to every one of us. Lord, thank you for your presence. God, it is so rich and so real. You are so kind. You are so faithful. Again, anoint our every heart, our every soul and mind and spirit to receive, yea, God, of your goodness daily. We thank you. We stand in awe of you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you so much. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. We uh, mean something to live for God in any age, any season, any time, and the words that in the world you shall have tribulation apply not just to us in the end time. Everyone that has ever lived for God pays a certain amount of price, and there are sacrifices. The book of Psalms, I think it's chapter 50, speaks of those that make a covenant with him by sacrifice. And, uh, but the thing about God and making of sacrifices, those sacrifices don't tend to last very long. The reason being is that God keeps very, very good books. And when he, he's very mindful and when we make a sacrifice, he steps on the scene and it doesn't remain sacrifice again very long. He knows, he keeps good books. He will owe no man anything. And he knows his business. And uh, when we cross the river, we will see the blessings that he has given us here on earth. 
the things he has protected us of are mind-boggling, things that we never even considered. Amen. He may show us a panorama of the times he saved our hides. And we didn't even know it to say thank you. On my way here tonight, uh, a guy in a blue truck apparently didn't, his blue truck did not like my red truck. And uh, anyway, we, we came close to colliding. And uh, he, had, he had a lot of room to go. He just didn't want to. And whatever. I didn't see him coming. He must have been coming fast. And blah, 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 blah. And my wife said, Larry, God really keeps his hand on you is all I can tell you. And I said, he, <laughs> he really does. He really does. He really does. Amen. I remember years ago when I gave my testimony, first time in California and Brother Carl Ballestero was standing at the back. I wasn't positive it was him, but it was. And after service, I went back and I said, are you Brother Ballestero? And he said, yes. He said, Larry Booker, when the night you prayed through to the Holy Ghost, I have no doubt angels were falling in corners all over the building saying, thank God that's over. And... Uh, I, I, I think those same angels have probably stuck with me all these years and protected me. Because um, in the world, again, no matter what, what, what age you come into, there's things that happen. It's things that happen in this life. You say, but I started living for God and because of that, I shouldn't have any more problems. I actually thought that in the early days of living for Jesus that... Now it was just, <sighs> if I'd had the vocabulary, I'd have said, I'm in the garden now. <sighs> and believe me, it's better to be, go west and get in the garden than to stay out east of Eden by far. But Jesus with his disciples, he said, these things I've spoken that in me, you might have peace. The peace is not found in this world. The peace is found in me. It's in knowing me, walking in me, allowing me to be in you and to be alive and well, etc. Some other transliterations of this, one puts it this way, I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I've overcome the world. Another one, I've told you that, I've told you all this so that trusting me you will be unshakable and assured, deeply at peace. That's in him. In this godless world, you will continue to experience difficulties. Another one, I've told you all this so that you'll have peace of heart and mind. Here on earth, you'll have many trials and sorrows. And then the Amplified, I've told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world you have tribulation and trials and distress and frustration, but be of good cheer, take courage, be confident, certain, be certain, undaunted, for I have overcome the world. I have deprived it of its power to harm you and have conquered it for you. That's our God. And that's why we take him by the hand and walk with him daily. Hallelujah. When I came to God again, and, and it, was a, it was a very small church, uh, but it was immediately to me the safest, sweetest, most wonderful place I had ever known. I remember sitting on the front seat about where these boys seat, sit, and the pew that was much closer to the pulpit. The pulpit was not raised up. It was on the floor. And, and the, the guy that was in 70 fights from the time, his middle and ninth grade year till the year after he graduated, some of them gang fights. And the bad, bad stuff. And if my friends would have saw me sitting there with a big chief notebook tablet and a number two lead pencil, like a little bird, writing down every scripture 
I had no idea how to spell them, but I'd figure it out. I'd find it eventually. And I'd write down and I'd go and I'd look up. It'd take me a long time to find the books. And it's really how I learned uh, where the Bible was laid out. And then I would call my pastor and drive the poor man crazy with questions every day, every day, every day. And finally he said, <clears throat> why don't you save up all your questions and call me once a week? And I said, sounds good to me. I mean, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think you had anything better to do than to just answer my questions. And boy, I have paid for that folly. <laughs> God, but be all that as it may. So the years have come and gone. I still do the big chief deal. It's nostalgic. It's, it's, it's nostalgic. That's the reason I do that. And I have to use a pen. I can't see the number two lead pencil anymore. But I, um, you never quit learning. You never, ever, 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 ever quit learning. But when I came to God and everything was so sweet and wonderful, I remember there was a lady in the church. She was up in years, and I honestly, my, my concepts, I had concepts that some were right and some were really stupid, but I had them. And, and I had a concept that the longer you were in church, the naturally sweeter you were, and the more holy you became. And, and I just, I couldn't wait. And I had to wait, but apparently I didn't have to wait long. Here I am. And... Uh, and, um, and so this lady, she, if I had to name her in those days, if I'd have known the, how to name it, I would have called her the testifier of Israel because when she would stand during testimony service, the sweetness that would pour forth the comfort, the, the beauty, just almost angelic. The smile. And, uh, and I was just, oh, oh. I thought she was like my grandma on steroids. And, <laughs> and uh, anyway, months came and went and time goes on. And, and I met my, my Brenda. And the first time I ever saw her, I was at a camp meeting. I came to God in, in uh, April and in July was a camp meeting. My hair had been down to here. And my pastor said I was like the guy that had a dog with a bad tail. Rather than cut it off all at once, he'd just kind of take it an inch at a time. So when I met her, my hair was still over my ears. But I was, I was at this camp meeting. I was praying for uh, one of my buddies that had come back from Pueblo with me. His name was Ed. And we always called him special. And... Uh, and there he was, we were praying, and all the young people had gathered around, and I'm praying, and I saw this girl, and I'm praying, and I, I looked at her, and I said to myself, that's the girl I'm going to marry. And I thought, that's crazy. And then um, afterwards, we went to the concession stand, and, and uh, we're talking, and this and that, and me and Special, we're talking to girls and we go back to the dorm and I'm on the bottom bunk and Ed's on the top bunk and I'm looking out the window and there's the moon and Ed said hey Larry I said yeah he said you know that Brenda girl I said yeah he said I kind of like her I put my foot on the lowest part of the bunk and I shoved it and he whoa and he came back down and I said forget it Ed Lo, it beareth witness. I said, uh, forget it, Eddie. I said, I'm going to marry her. And I looked out the window and I thought, I am losing my mind. But we sure enough got married. And she got to hear the testifier of Israel and all was well. And, and then one day I was, um, we were in uh, our first apartment and it was a Saturday afternoon and I was going to take a nap and I was lying on my back and I was in, I wasn't asleep yet, but I wasn't fully awake and I, and, and there before me was this angelic testifier of Israel 
and she was just, just, and, and while she was, she was doing that, and I, I just got, and I was like, seeing her, and she went, Hurrah! and I jumped, and I was wide awake, and I thought, whoa, what was that all about? So a week or so later, I was in Tulsa with uh, my pastor. I can't remember why we were down there, but we were, we were walking the sidewalk down to the car or whatever. I said, you know, Brother Moss, I had a strange thing happen, and I don't know what to think about it. It's really weird. He said, well, what is it? So we're talking, and I'm telling him, and he stops. And, and um, he was tall, but not quite as tall as me. He looked at me, and I looked at him. He said, Hmm. I said, what's that mean? He said, we'll see. <laughs> well, apparently he had, had to do business with the testifier of Israel. And, and so it wasn't all that many months before I began to find out the side of the testifier of Israel. And, and I realized it was a less than stellarly perfect situation. And if I would have approached her husband apparently and said, your, my, your wife is like my grandma on steroids. She's the testifier of Israel. I would have probably got to look something of that nature. And then this was a really sad part. The young man that was so unbelievably instrumental in my salvation. He had been in church six months longer than I, and I used to be a running buddy of his in Pueblo, and um, we, were, it, we were a pair. He was brilliant, utterly, unbelievably brilliant. He, could, uh, he was very, very good looking, healthy. He could open the Bible anywhere, read a chapter twice, Sometimes you might have to read it three times. He could shut the book and quote you the chapter. He was, he was brilliant. And the potential the young man had was just literally unbelievable. And he was the one that the night that I finally broke, I snapped. I was shattered. And I made it back home from Denver, still alive by the mercies of God, totally and I fell by my bed and I said, God, I will do anything, anything in the world for you. Just get me out of here. And he was 650 miles away praying for me. And the Lord said, arise, go get Larry. He is ready now. And he drove all night long, picked me up. And the long story short, gets me back. To Bartlesville on Easter Sunday, I go, we get five in the morning, we go to church that night, I bawl and squall and sob, I'm baptized in Jesus' name, five nights later I get the Holy Ghost. And so this young man, I, I love dearly, and on and on and on, but uh, he went sideways. It was very sad, it was very, very tragically sad, and how far he went and how bad he went and how how crazy he got in the spirit. He got so tangled up with bitterness and envies and it was breathtaking. And, um, and, and he, in front of my parents, I hadn't been in church for just a few months and they drive 650 miles away and I didn't go, um, I had to go to work. I went to church twice. They got in on Saturday. I went to church twice on Sunday and then, and then I worked Monday, spent Monday night with them. Had to go to work on Tuesday. Tuesday night we had church. And they were leaving Wednesday. And they were upset. They said, we're leaving tomorrow. And, uh, and I said, I'm sorry. I, I said, you know what I was before God found me. And I, I can't go back to that. Doctors couldn't help me. You couldn't help me. Police, good police and bad police couldn't help me. My probation officer couldn't help me. Psychologists could not help me. Doctors couldn't help me. Teachers couldn't help me. Counselors couldn't help me. Nobody could help me. I said, I finally found my help. It's, it's through God, through the church. And I said, I, I can't, I, I can't miss. I can't, I'm sorry. To which he, in front of my parents said, 
If you loved your mother and father, you wouldn't go to church tonight. And it got really quiet. <sighs> Why he would do that? And I said, Mom and Dad, I'm sorry. I got to go. And that night was the night my pastor was preaching. I felt so horrid. And it was somewhere in the book of Psalms, and my Bible was on my lap. And I told a brother this morning, he asked me, when did I know for sure I was called to preach? That night, feeling so rancid and broken and wretched, when my pastor was preaching and I've got my Bible open, I felt like I was on a high, 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 high diving board. And I was going in slow motion down towards the pool of the waters of his word and going into the waters. And I knew that moment I'd spend my life preaching this word. That's the night I knew. And the thing about Oklahoma, they say if you don't like the weather, stick around, it'll change. And this took apparently all peoples by surprise. Uh, there was no weather warning whatsoever that night. A blizzard came into town. And my parents couldn't get out of town. Nobody could get out of town. I could not go to work. I got to spend all day Wednesday. Wednesday night, I couldn't go to work on Thursday. I got to spend Thursday with them. My pastor didn't stop church for nothing. And he, we had, but I only lived down the street. And so me and four others went to church that night. And then, uh, and then, and then on Friday, they couldn't get out of town until Wednesday. But on Friday, we're driving around until Saturday. And we're driving around on Friday and my dad said, Larry, I said, yes, sir. I'm going to tell you something. I said, yes, sir. If you're going to live for God, yes, sir. And he did not. He said, you better do it with all your heart. You better do it with everything that's in you. You hear me? Because if you don't, you're not worth your salt. I said, yes, sir. He said, that includes going to church. Don't miss church. God knows his business. God knows his business. So things I begin to find out happened in the kingdom. All was not perfect. There were situations. And, and as I go through this, I'm trying to make my adjustments, my mental, emotional, spiritual adjustments that, that thank God for the kingdom. I've been east of Eden. Thank God for the garden. But it's not always perfect in the garden. And then when you go back, you find out that the, the kingdom has always had its troubles. We know that Cain and his brother Abel both offered up sacrifices. But Cain's were of his own mind. It was not the, the blood of a firstborn lamb. And so the writer, St. John, writes in the first book of the gospel, of, of the, the uh, epistle of John, he said, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, Abel. Wherefore, did he slew, wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. So back, back in the earliest days of the kingdom, there was bad troubles. And every patriarch you want to name, if you want to talk about Abraham... You cannot talk about Abraham without bringing up Hagar. When you bring up Hagar, you bring up his son Ishmael. When you bring up Hagar and Ishmael, you also know that he had a first wife by the name of Sarah. And he had a nephew by the name of Lot. And, and life got really interesting between Hagar and Sarah. And then between Ishmael and Isaac. And then with his nephew Lot who pitched his tent towards, tent towards Sodom. And, and so in Abraham's life, this epitome of the kingdom, the father of the faithful, we find that, that it's not perfect there, but he's the father of the faithful. And we see the towering figure that he is, but there were times that were better than others. Amen. Isaac found his wife, Rebecca, or she was rather found for him. And he has two boys, Jacob and Esau. 
and we find there's problems in their world and in their life. Then Jacob, we find he deceives his father Isaac. He gets the blessing. He has to leave home lest his brother kill him. He goes to his uncle Laban's and there he meets Rachel. He falls instantly in love. And then the years come and go, basically 20 years of the tug of war with Laban and his machinations, his business machinations versus this young man, Jacob, who God would bless through every situation and just help. But, but it wasn't all peaches and cream. There were problems. There were traumas in Jacob's family and, and between Rachel and her sister Leah and then Bildad and Zilpah, the, 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 the other concubines that, or servant girls that he took to wife so that, so that she could have more kids and this one. And it, got, it, it was a mess. But it became the patriarchs of Israel. And, and, and it was interesting. And then we find that these sons got a boy, uh, Jacob's got a boy named Jacob, the son of Rachel. And just in case you wondered what it was like. And uh, at one point he's meeting his brother Esau that still he thinks is bent on killing him. And he separates, he starts sending off cattle and sending off portions of herds. And he's, he's giving him presents. And, and then he takes his family. And he takes the Bildad and Zilpah, uh, Zilpah and Bilhar and sets their kids together. And you go first, then there's Leah and her sons and Dinah the daughter. And in the far back is Rachel and Joseph. And nobody ever forgot that day. They looked back. And the ones out front thought, well, this is the words we'd use today. I guess apparently we're cannon fodder in this house. And maybe by the time Esau gets done killing everything, he'll be too tired to take out sweet little Joseph. And so the animus between these kids grows to the place. And then, God bless his heart, Joseph starts having dreams from God. And then, bless his heart, he doesn't know any better but than to tell his brethren his dreams. Do you know I had a dream that my sheaf was out there in the field and every one of you were big sheaves and all of you fell down and bowed did obeisance to me. Well, that, that dream went over like a flock of dogs. And he said, well, try this one. I was a star in the heavens, a bright star, and you are all stars. And daddy was the sun and mama was the moon. And all of you were doing obeisance to me. That dream didn't go over either. And the Bible says they hated him. They hated him. And no one has a right. Let me tell you something. Hatred is like battery acid trying to carry it around in a plastic jug. It'll just eat you alive. But here we go. And God, listen closely, knows how to make the best out of bad situations. And so Joseph goes on as a prisoner. His brethren are going to sell him. They go over the hill to eat. Here comes Ishmaelites. They steal him away. They sell him to Midianites. Midianites sell him to Egyptians. Egyptians sell him to Potiphar. And we know the rest of the story. 20 years later, famine is hitting the world. Here comes 10 older brothers. And they're standing before a strange enigmatic man. They don't know he speaks Hebrew because they don't know it's Joseph. And he's the second most powerful man, apparently, in the world order at that moment. And they're all doing obeisance to him. So... The kingdom has had its problems. Moses had a sister named Miriam. One day God turned her into a leper because she didn't know when to keep her mouth shut. Aaron made a golden calf. 
and God would have killed him had not Moses interceded. There was a mixed multitude that followed the children of Israel out and Moses himself one day, instead of speaking to a rock, he smites the rock, amen, once too many and he's not allowed to go into the promised land. This is the kingdom of God. You go to the book of Judges and you find Israel backsliding seven times. You have good, good judges like Gideon. You have bad judges like Samson. Then you end up with the last set of judges. You have Eli, his sons. And then there's Samuel. Samuel's sons are not the greatest. And then God raises up King Saul. And King Saul goes bad. Let me give you the title of what I'm preaching tonight. I'm talking to us about the ragged edges of the kingdom. Brothers and sister, there's no place I'd rather be. But I'm here to tell you the kingdom has ragged edges. But there's no place I'd rather be. Try East of Eden if you want. I'd rather be in the garden with its ragged edges. Any day. Any day. Any day. You say, well, yeah, but finally God raised up a king. He was a man after God's own heart. And his name was David. And David had his problems. If you don't believe that, ask Uzziah. Well, I guess you can't because David had him killed. And it got bad. But he knew how to repent. And he knew how to go forward. And God actually made him the benchmark for all future kings. He judged every future king of Judah based on what they did or did not do according to David. God said, he's a man after my own heart. And there's not many clues. We don't know why. But we do know this. But King James Version, I have not checked this out in Hebrew, but in King James English, he's the first man to tell God he loves him. I'm sure Abraham, Isaac, Jacob loved him, but they never told it or it never found its way into scripture. David's the first one to tell God, I love you. And also, technically, he's the first man in King James English to say, thank you. Now Jacob got close. He said, I'm not worthy of the mercy and the truth which thou hast shown me. But to actually say thank you, David is the first. I'm not saying they didn't. I'm just saying scripturally God pegged it. He was the first. So when I see unthankfulness, you say, I, I'm not going to church. There's too many problems there. No, no, no. I'm going to tell you something. You need, it's like going to the hospital. You go to the hospital, there's things that stink. There's moans and groans. There's pain. Hey, there are mistakes made in hospitals. People, more people die in hospitals than anywhere else. Yeah, that's true. But I'm going to tell you something. I know this. God used the hospital and the surgeon after 10 years of doing everything. And, and finally, my, my, my children, we begged God. My wife would... We'd prayed, we'd prayed, we'd prayed until we were purple with praying and beseeching. And my wife had a problem and, and she had to go into emergency and I'm back east somewhere. And, and Erica was taking her to, and I said, Erica, let's pray right now and tell the boys, tell the girls, Jesus send the perfect doctor that can figure out what's wrong with my wife. And so here's a man in his seventies. He's on the sixth day of 12 hour shifts and he's like, I'm getting out of here. And he's listening to her, but he's not quite. And my wife's telling him, and finally Eric is telling him and he said, I think I know your problem. And he did. And he performed surgery and fixed her after 12 years of suffering. And I, I, don't, I don't pretend to understand all this stuff, but I told that to Brother Barry Sutton. And, and we went on a cruise with the Suttons years ago, and we were, we were in the Baltic Sea or somewhere. And, 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 and he said, I told him that story. He said, do you remember when we were on that trip? I said, yes. He said, did you know my wife was sick every day? I said, I think you mentioned it, but she hid it well. She goes, my wife's tough. She was deeply nauseated every day. In fact, she was nauseated every day for years. 
And she went to doctor after doctor. We prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. One night she had a dream. In this dream, our youngest daughter went to her mother. In the dream, I can't remember the doctor's name. I'm going to say Faraday. Said, mother, go see Dr. Faraday. He knows your problem. And she woke up. She called her daughter. Who's Dr. Faraday? She said, I have no idea. She told her about the dream. Said, well, if I was you, I'd get in the phone book and find Dr. Faraday. So she got in the phone book and she found a Dr. Faraday. And she sat down in his office. He said, tell me your problems. And, and she goes, well, I'm nauseated. And she goes, are you taking any medication? Yes, I do have a problem with arthritis. And I'm, I take uh, arthritis medication. He said, you have any with you? He said, yes. She said, yes. He took the bottle. This is after years, years, and many doctors. He said, here's your problem. This medication has a certain ingredient, and he named the ingredient. One out of a thousand people, it makes them nauseous. He changed her medication that moment. By that afternoon, she was fine. So, yes, hospitals can be a deal. But at the same time, I'm glad they're around. And the point is, there can be situations less than stellar and problems in churches. But thank God for the, thank God for the garden. Thank God. Thank God. Jesus said, look, you're going to have problems. I'm the fixer. I'm the comforter. I'm the friend that sticks closer than a brother. I'm here to help you. It's going to be okay. I've overcame the world and the church belongs to me. Hallelujah. You say, well, well, thank God there was no problems in the church in the book of Acts. Well, that's not quite the case. In chapter 6, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministrations. And what that's talking about was they're all baptized, they all got the Holy Ghost, they've all repented, but the Grecians were Hebrews that had been Hellenized. They, the Grecian influence had affected them. They, they had walked away from the righteous decrees of the Torah, but they caught the revelation of who Jesus was. They repented of their sins. They were baptized in Jesus' name. They were filled with the Holy Ghost, and they were as saved as were the Hebrews that had stuck with the Torah. But when the daily ministration was giving, they were giving out food and stuff, those were being somewhat neglected. Yeah, you know, you were Hellenized. We'll, we'll get to you later. And so, this is the church. And the apostles say, we, we can't, we got to stick with our book and Bible and prayer and preparing. Get seven men full of the Holy Ghost. Set them over this matter. And those seven men full of the Holy Ghost put the matter at rest. But there was, there was some ragged edges in the kingdom. And at one point you have a guy by the name of Saul of Tarsus breathing out threatenings and slaughters. But he's on his way to Damascus. He's got letters of intent from the high priest. He's going to go into the synagogues of Damascus and anybody that says they're a Christian, he's going to do to them what he'd been doing in Jerusalem. He's going to compel them to blaspheme if need be, put them to death, do everything he can to get them to recant. But while he's on his way, a bright light shines and knocks him down to his knees. A voice says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he says, who are you? And he says, I am Jesus. Ooh. He prays and fasts three days, no food, no water. Ananias, the disciple, comes in, lays hands on him. He receives his eyesight. He says, why are you tarrying? Get your sins washed away. He baptizes him in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then... We know he got the Holy Ghost. He said, actually, I speak in tongues more than you all. And so here he is. Barnabas searches him out. After three years, he goes to Tarsus. He comes back to Antioch. Antioch is a church. 
full of Jews that fled Jerusalem because of the great persecution in Jerusalem. And I can see in my mind's eye Barnabas saying, We have a special speaker today. I've talked with him at length. He's a good man. He's repented. He's been baptized. Got the Holy Ghost. Yeah! And he brings Saul of Tarsus to the podium. And there's people out there saying, well, if you were going to save him, why didn't you save him before he had my husband killed? Why didn't you save him before my boy was put to death? But that, after his intro to the church of Antioch, in my mind, that's why the very next verse says they were called Christians first at Antioch. Somewhere you got to know where to lay down the ragged edges and say, let God be true and every man a liar. If God saved him, he saved him. And you say, they all, they all lived happily ever after until that same Saul now called the Apostle Paul is, 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 is at any ark and here comes Simon Peter and Simon Peter has been... Uh, Hanging around the Gentiles having a good time until here come other believers from Jerusalem straight from James and they get up and, and disassociate from the Gentiles. Even Barnabas backs away and he'd want a bunch of them to God. And so sweet Paul, he rebukes Peter to his face in front of God and everybody. Hey boy, you come down here and live like the Gentiles and then you want the Gentiles to live like the Jews I'm rebuking you you're not walking uprightly according to the gospel read it for yourself but Peter would later write about his beloved, beloved brother Paul whose writings are sometimes hard to be understood and which are unstable take his writings and other scriptures and twist them up to their own destruction he could have put P.S., but when he speaks, he's very clear. <laughs> and at one point, he takes, this is, he and Barnabas become the greatest missionary team probably in all of history. And they go forth and he takes his nephew with him. Some say his cousin, his name's John Mark. And they go to two cities and John Mark says, whoa, dude, I'm out of here. I'm going home. Paul says, free kingdom if you want to go well they do great 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 works they go back to Antioch they're there for a couple of years and Paul said let's go back and check out the churches we started and he said good I'll get John Mark for what he go with us why because he wants to go I mean he's a good young man well then why didn't that good young man stay with us the first time well, I don't know. I mean, he's a good, he was just a kid. He just, well, I don't care what he was. Now, we don't have the details. But the Bible said the dissension was so great between them. I mean, I could, I could, see, I could see Barnabas saying, you know, you're being pretty hard on the boy. He made it hard on himself. Well, if my memory serves me correct, I'm the one that fetched you out of Tarsus and brought you to this place to begin with. Nobody would touch you with a 10-foot pole until I came and got you. Well, that might be, and to that I say thank you. Maybe you can show the same mercies towards John Mark because he's not going with me. It's there. And so John Mark takes... Barnabas takes John Mark and Paul takes Silas and they go their ways. I'd say that's a pretty ragged edge in the kingdom. And I can see, however, 
Barnabas, this son of consolation, sitting around a fire. It's okay, John. We'll take care of you. John's calling. I'm t- <laughs> and, and they're sitting around the fire, and John's feeling so glum and so sad. Barnabas scoots down on the log next to him, puts his arm around him, and says, Ah, oh, boy, come on, it's going to be all right. You're going to make it. Man, he was really upset. I, I really blew it. And he said, No, Paul will probably go down in history as one of the greatest Christians that have ever lived. You can make it. Listen to me, son. Learn from this. Don't let it make you bitter. Don't let the ragged edges of the kingdom throw you out of the kingdom. Learn from them. And say, God, okay, I'm going to... I'm going to learn what I'm supposed to learn and I'm going forward and I'm going to be what God wants me to be. And then somewhere he gets hooked up with Simon Peter to the point that Simon refers to him in his gospels as my son, Marcus, my son. So they're very, very close. And somewhere in the process of it, I can hear him say, I heard you had a bump with Paul. Well, it's more like a Mack truck hitting me, but yeah, it was a bump. Yeah, I've been hit by that same truck. He hit me at Antioch in front of God and everybody. Yeah. But I'm going to tell you something, John, listen to me. Listen to me, buddy. Paul is a piece of cake compared to Jesus. I remember the day I was just, he was telling us he's going to be crucified and die a horrible death. And I stepped up and said, hey, you going to happen? Not as long as I'm around here. And he looks at me and says, get behind me, Satan. You're an offense unto me. You don't savor the things of God. You savor the things of man. And he turned his back on me. And all of the other apostles were like. He said, he could have said, they all turned their back on me. Said, so don't worry about it. I survived. You'll survive. Then he starts telling him other stories, which is why they say the gospel of Mark tells us more of Simon Peter's problems than any of the other gospels. And it's really Simon Peter speaking through John Mark. The ragged edges of the kingdom are very important if we learn from them and we don't stumble over them. There's something that we've just got to say, God, I'm not going to be bitter. I promise you by the grace of God, I'm going to be better. I'm going to learn from this. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. And if you think the kingdom is perfect, all you got to do is go to the book of Revelation and read the letters to the seven churches of Asia and only Two of them were not rebuked. Five of them. And one of the best of the five. Ephesus. You've tried them and say they're apostles and are not. And I found them liars. But as much as I admire that. You're allowing yourself to get hardened. You're leaving your first love. And if you don't get it right. I'll pull your candlestick out. This is why, this is why that same apostle told us again and again and again and again, come on, suck it up, love one another, go forward, be what God wants you to be. I'm closer to being done than what you think. The kingdom has always had its ragged edges. And I talked this morning about the Garden of Eden. Listen closely. Even the Garden of Eden had a serpent that would whisper and would lurk. So whenever you find that things are less than perfection or stellar in the kingdom of God, just be thankful there is a kingdom of God. Just be thankful. Just be thankful. 
I remember hearing a man tell this story. I'm not even sure if he's still alive, but a extremely highly noted preacher. And, and, and I, I've preached in the church that he was pastoring at, at that time, not when he was there, but later. But he, he told a story about how one morning, and he said, they, they were early risers, but not like 6 a.m. They, they would get up and start their days relatively early, but not at 6. And he said, he, said he, uh, he was lying on his back, and all of a sudden his eyes came wide open. He wasn't drowsy. He was wide awake. He turned. He looked at the clock. It was 6 a.m. He knew something was up. He turned and looked at his wife. She was lying on her back, her eyes wide open. And she turned and looked at him. And he said, what's up? She said, I just had a dream. I just woke up. And the dream was from God. He said, what was the dream? She said, the dream was that we were in this bed. We were seated up. Our backs against the backboard. You had full pajamas. I had a robe. And our entire church was in our house. Everyone in the church was in our house, but they were every one of them little children. She said, I knew every single one of them. They were little children and they were doing what little children do. They would laugh and play and run and go and tag and said, but, but the children said it happened continually. A couple would, two or three would come over to your side of the bed and They'd want a hug and you'd give them a hug and, and two or three would come over to my side of the bed and I'd give them a hug and they'd smile and they'd go and they're playing in some more and some more. And, and she said, but honey, you know, brother so-and-so, there was a man in the church. He said, yes. He didn't come up for a hug. He said, I'm not surprised. He was a trouble, a man of trouble. He said he'd like go from one mess to the next, be with people. He said to be with him. He just was contrary. She said, "Honey, he was in the far corner of our bedroom. He was in the corner, and he was like this, and he was looking around. He wouldn't move. The kids weren't playing with him. He just stood there." I said, "Okay." I'm just, she said, baby, he was mongoloid. She said, what do you think that means? He said, I don't know what it means to you, but I know what it means to me. And I will never, as long as I live, look at that man the same way again. It's just him. And he's our child. And we love him. And he said he never did look at that man the same from that day. He considered him a different spiritual situation. He would be kind when he felt like screaming. He would be patient. when, And he said he always went from one mess to the next but said from that day forward when I would get involved, he always had remorse. Like, I'm sorry I let you down, Pastor. Because he saw him differently. And sometimes in this kingdom, there's ragged edges and there's things we have no idea about what people have gone through. Like a young man that I pastored for years that he could, he, could, he could snap, he could have anger issues and struggle. But he loved me and I loved him. And in the course of talking to him one day, I'll never forget this moment as long as I live. He said, you know, I was adopted. I said, yes. My father was military. We traveled all over the country, different places of the world. Yes, he was a high officer told me yes 
He was a disciplinarian's disciplinarian, yes. And said, I was, I was a boy and I got an attitude because he, he beat me so much. He said, when I got about 12 or 13 and he pulled off his belt, I knew it was just another beating. And he said, I remember the beating where I couldn't cry. I, I didn't cry. And because I wasn't crying, I wasn't even tearing up. He beat me some more. And after a while, he shook me and said, what's wrong with you? He said, Dad, you can beat me to death. I've shed my last tear. I don't have any tears left. I don't know what to tell you. I'm sorry. I wish I could cry. I can't. So he said he, he never beat me again. He would just tie me up with clothesline wire and put me in the closet for three days at a time. And now I'm his pastor. And now I'm trying to help him and his wife get along. There's things we just don't know why. Some edges are so ragged. But I think there's things in life if we really, really knew. Such as the lady that we pastor, love very much. She's went through Hades in her years, but things have happened. And she said, I remember when I was a little girl, she said she had the Holy Ghost, was baptized in Jesus' name. She said, all I can tell you is my mother had issues. And uh, I think there's chemical names involved today if it was diagnosed. There's other terms that could be used. I think the woman might have had, I don't know. But she said, I remember when I was seven years old, my mother would make me hang my dresses up on the hangers. Not just to hang them up, but I had to, I had to weave a straight pin through each shoulder between there and the, and the wire so that the dress was secure on the hanger. And you couldn't pull it off. You had to remove the pin to get the dress off. And she said, one night I was in a hurry and I just put a pin, a pin. And every now and then, my, my, and it was happened to be that night my mother came through and she went with the dresses and one that I didn't, I just stuck a pin and it fell off. She said, that was the night my mother beat me to death. She said, when she left the room and I came to, how I crawled to my bed, I don't know, but she said I crawled. How I got on my bed, I don't know, but I got there. And I laid back on my back. And she said, I died, Brother Booker, I was seven years old. I left my body. And I saw my body. I saw the blood, the lips, over the eye, the bruises already formed. And said, I'm staring at my body. And then I turned and I didn't see the roof of my house. She said, it felt like a gentle vacuum <laughs> took me away. And she said, I came into a garden, she said, if I can use the word garden. She said, it was beautiful beyond what words can tell. The beauty, the peace. She said, I'm just, it was majestic. There was no pain in me. And she turned and she said, there was a girl. She, was, she, she looked to be about eight, maybe nine. And she there was a bench, if you could call it a bench. It was, and she sat down on the bench and she said, come sit by me, Nina. And she patted, come sit by me. But her lips never moved. And I sat down and I noticed she was staring around me. And she was staring and I wondered what she was looking at. So I, I turned and she said, I saw it, Brother Booker. 
I use the word city because there's no other word in our language that is even tiny close, but it was a city times 10 million beyond and the glory and the beauty colors I never knew existed and so peaceful and she said oh I want to stay here and she said that's as far as I got I felt <laughs> and then I was back in my room and I saw the dead little me and I went back into it and I opened my eyes and she said, I didn't know that a human could feel this much pain. But she said, I never forgot what I saw. And I determined as a seven year old girl from that moment, that's where I'm going. It don't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what comes or what goes. No, no, no. And now she's in her 50s. And she's living for God. Nothing is perfect. I love this church. This church will spoil you fast. But I'm not pastoring it. And you find out churches because people are not perfect. If you don't believe that, check out your family. If you don't believe that, check out the mirror. Check out the mirror. Everybody was so kind. That introduction to this morning was so touching. I think of J.T. Pugh. He was preaching one of his first camp meetings and it was going. He, people getting the Holy Ghost left and right. He said people were bragging on him and he was just, he said it was, ooh, he said it was this. And he said, I was walking across the campground. He said, I was rather enjoying myself. And he said, the Lord spoke to me and said, what if they knew you like I do? He said he never looked at another introduction the same <laughs> after that. Amen. I'm almost done. If you ever get a chance and you're on vacation, go to Kentucky. I don't remember where it's at, but it's Noah's Ark. Go to Kentucky and say, I want to see Noah's Ark. Everybody will tell you how to get there. It's a replicated Noah's Ark. I actually myself think it's a little shorter than the original, but who knows? Be that as it may, there ain't nothing to make you think like that. Huge boat makes you think. And as big as it was and laid out as it was, and there was one window at the top, do you think that boat ever started to stink? And, and somebody had to know how to use shovels. And, and we know that when they got off the ark and there was long enough time to plant a vineyard and there was long enough time for it to grow and there was long enough time for it to produce and there was long enough time for it to make wine, that Ham was apparently looking for problems with his father. And he had an attitude and was thus cursed for it. Makes me wonder if he had an attitude off the ark, did he have an attitude while he was on the ark? Do you suppose the smell bothered him? Do you suppose, amen, the, the chores bothered him? Do you suppose he got bored on the ark? Amen. When COVID hit in 2020 and streets were clear and homes were full and all that stuff, people were going crazy. Can you imagine being on a boat for a year? One window at the top? And I know they, but anyway, I just wonder if one day, I wonder if Noah said, boy, we're going to have a little talk. Come with me. Dad, I, I said, come with me. 
And they go up the ladders and they go up from one floor to the next floor to the next floor and they go up, they go up to the top and he lifts the lid and he takes them out and he looks over the edge. He said, take a look, boy! You see them bloated bodies? You see those sharks swimming? I'm here to tell you, yes, it gets stinky in there, but the stink's better than the storm. I'd rather be in the church on its worst day than in this world on its best day. It's got ragged edges, but I ain't going nowhere. Musicians come. There are, you can be seated for just a moment. There are less than stellar situations. There's problems and trials and traumas. And there will be, listen to me, even during the millennial reign. In the millennial reign, there will be nations that will not come up and do homage to Jesus. So they don't get no rain that year. In the millennial reign, there will be sinners. They'll live to be 100 years old and not live for God. They will die, but they'll be sinners. He'll rule and reign from Jerusalem. We'll rule and reign with him. And there will be people, the devil's bound. The earth brings forth its increase. It's the most perfect government the world has ever known. And there will still be people not living for God. But there will be people that will. So even in a millennium, there'll be ragged edges. But I want to be there to rule and reign with him. I want to be part of it. Amen. Now let's stand. In the kingdom, thank God there's help. In the kingdom, thank God there's hope. In the kingdom, thank God you can find peace. In the kingdom, there's love and there's goodness and there's mercy. In the kingdom, the church is not perfection, but it's the best hospital on earth. So what do you do when you're living in a kingdom that's got ragged edges? Listen to me closely. You get a needle and thread and you keep it on you at all times and you do your best not to make problems, but to make it better. To make it better. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sew this up best I can. I'm going to help best I can. And I'm going to tell you something. I believe this about his son. I watched Brother Copeland the last many years I was able to say this about another man whenever I meet a man like this I'm so thankful he walked around with a needle and thread and those of you that were here you know he walked around with needle and thread he's sewing up he's sewing things up there's times when other preachers would have took people's heads off. That's what you do in a kingdom where there's ragged edges. You say, I'm not going to be part of the problem. I'm going to be part of the solution. I'm going to stitch where I can. I'm going to pray all I can. I'm going to love. I'm going to care. I'm going to do my best to make it better. Hallelujah. I'm just glad he let me be in the kingdom. I'm just glad I've got brothers and sisters in the kingdom. I'm glad I've got friends, mothers in Israel that are real and love and care. And watch out for us. Elders that care. People with wisdom and grace. Nobody's perfect. But one of these days, a trumpet is going to sound. And as for you and I, the millennial will have its problems, but we won't be part of that problem. This 
this corruption will put on incorruption. This mortality will put on immortality. Our souls have been redeemed. Our spirits have been redeemed. But we ourselves grown within ourselves waiting. Amen. For the adoption to which the redemption of our bodies. No more trial. No more tears. Amen. No more weakness. No more. No more. We will be changed. And we'll be like him. So till then, till then, till then, you just hang in there, baby. Pastor, I want to be a blessing. I don't want to be a burden. I'm, 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 if, if, if and when and where I need it, talk to me. Don't, don't be shy. Talk to me. I know you do it with love because you love me. ears to hear and say God I'm going to do everything I can to help build this new church to help support the building of that new church and to make this the one of the, it is already but to make this one of the greatest one God Jesus name apostolic churches in the kingdom that we continue to start churches that we continue to send out missionaries that we continue it just gets bigger and better and more powerful because we're part of the kingdom and so if anybody's here that's thankful that God would take the likes of us and put us in the kingdom maybe you want to come down and lift your hands and say thank you thank you if you're here tonight and you're not a part of the kingdom and you're just in full you're in a world full of trouble and chaos and trauma and tears and it doesn't look like there's a way out i'm telling you there's a way out tonight there's a kingdom there's a garden no we're not perfect but jesus is he'll be a friend that sticks closer than a brother Come on, young man. Come on, young lady. That's it. God loves you. Come on, mama. Come on, daddy. God loves you. He's here to help us. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings into the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow, become a servant of righteousness, keep self pure, be an example, have faith in God, follow Jesus, put first things first, Resist temptation, be faithful, and be fruitful.